All right. Dr. Bruning, I am so excited to talk to you, and I think my audience is going to be so thrilled with what you have to share. You know, I always ask at the very beginning, I love to hear how, how people get to where they're going. Like, what, what drove you into your profession and, and what you've been spending your career actually working on? Sure. Well, this is probably my third or fourth career. So I was a college professor for 25 years in the field of management, and my PhD is in a totally different subject. And I had the good fortune to take early retirement. I think the law required that when I was 49, they sent me a letter advising me of my retirement benefits, and it burned a hole in my pocket, you could say. <laughs> Um, and I started dreaming of having the freedom to think what I wanted to think and do what I wanted to do. Um, and what I wanted to do, I think we're all wired by our early experience. And in my early years, I was surrounded by a lot of unhappiness. And I was always trying to understand, like, what are people always so, so upset about? And nothing that I learned in academic psychology was fully satisfying to me. And I think because it wasn't my primary profession, I was able to connect the dots in different strands of psychology. And when I discovered one little crumb of information here and another little crumb there, I had the time and the interest in pursuing it. That's fabulous. You know, I, I, I think it's very interesting. I've had three distinct careers, like completely separate. Yes. And I do think, I do think, so one of the reasons why I created this show and really what drives me today is I have the feeling that women that are in the second season of life, this is where we actually, even if you look at the statistics, we actually leave our greatest mark over mm -hmm. 50. And so mm -hmm. the idea of, oh, you're going to be forced into retirement, or this is what's going to happen next. And then you're just supposed to go into the sweet nothing or whatever is silly. Um, because we have so much that we want to give and do and learn. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, a lot of college professors are known for dying at their desks. So I was the only person who decided to leave. And I'm eternally grateful to my husband for letting me do that. And I have to say that I'm not really making money at what I'm doing now. I mean, just to be fair, because young people think you can make money by doing something fun. And so I want to be honest about that. <laughs> Sometimes it can be challenging. That is very, very true. That is very true. So I want to go back because because what your driving question really was, why is it so hard to be happy? So why is it? So our brain is not designed to be happy all the time. It's designed to promote survival. And the happy brain chemicals evolved to reward you for behaviors that promote survival in that immediate moment. So if you just felt good all the time, that wouldn't give you the information like now is the moment act. But how we define those moments is a combination of primal impulses that would have made sense in the state of nature, plus the wiring we build from our early experience, which is childhood. And that's why it's so hard to figure out like, why am I happy about X or unhappy about Y? That's interesting because you're really going back and looking at why the actions of mammals, animals on the planet and how, you know, in a very simplistic way, because they don't have all of this mechanics in their brain to rationalize and compute and do all these different things, how their behaviors really exhibit and their biochemistry exhibit these, these these things. And it's really interesting because, you know, I don't think any of us thought of that kind of brain chemistry as a survival mechanism, you know, the feel good chemistry. So, so tell me a little bit about the what you found in the animal kingdom, like what kind of things are really important to that animal activities, you know, like obviously the the reproduction and other pieces share a little bit of that with my with my listeners. Sure. So if anyone has watched nature videos, they have somewhat of a sense of the urgency about survival that animals have. First, you have to forage all day in order to get enough food to eat. Before cooked food came along, it really takes a huge amount of time for the, the chewing to get enough nutrition, not to mention the foraging. So animals spend their whole day doing that and it's hard. Like the whole idea that you just sit around and pick a fruit off a tree and have lots of free time to make love, that was invented by Harvard anthropologists a hundred years ago. But before that, everyone knew that survival took a lot of work. 
Now, also, if you've watched nature videos, you know that animals are very competitive about mating opportunity. And this is what blew my mind, like, wow, nobody told me about this. So any extra energy they have left over after this um, quest for food and water and warmth or safety is to compete not only for mating opportunity, but for quote unquote, better mating opportunity. So you can see how people drive themselves crazy over getting a better partner. But I also include within what biologists call reproductive opportunity is whatever keeps your children alive because in the state of nature, lots of children died and anything that advantages your children is also something you invest a lot of effort in. So the animal brain rewards you with a good feeling when you do anything that meets those survival needs. It's, that's so interesting because I, you know, like you said, an anthropologist came up with this sort of idea that we're just plucking fruit off the tree and then, you know, happily making love in the Garden of Eden or whatever, whatever origin story you want to pick. But, you know, I, so my gra my grandmother was born in the late 1800s, so 1893 uh, on a farm in Nebraska, and I can tell you that their life was foraging and scrapping to make it by. So this does seem like a very indulgent kind of modern belief system that we have that things like this should be easy. Yes, exactly. And that something is wrong if it's not easy. And in the something is wrong category, okay, first there's like the societal level and politics and ideology that people use. But then on the individual level is I must have a mental health disorder if my brain is not just spewing happy chemicals all the time for no reason. So these are the philosophies that people are exposed to and as, as I was. And that's why it blew my mind when I started discovering other facts. Exactly. I mean, even, even just the idea of marriage, right? So the idea of marriage 150 years ago was a business. It was a business. It was a contract between families to continue the family line and, and you know, dowries and all that, those other things, it, you know, which of course is offensive to any, any woman today, but it's just, it's so unique. And I think that kind of societal pressure that we put on ourselves to, you know, we think that we should be happy or we think that everything but should... here's the amazing thing though in the past if you were forced to marry this particular person but you really had eyes for someone else and you thought oh i'll be happy forever if only i could be with him or her but then what happens when you now get unlimited choice does it make you happy no it doesn't so that's what we need to understand oh that is what a great point what a great point, because we do. I mean, 200 years ago, it was very unheard of to go, I'm going to get divorced because I'm unhappy. But today we're like, oh, I can just do that in a heartbeat. And I'm going to go find yeah. another better suitor. Yeah. An another. Better and, and I'll give you another sort of interesting example. When I was a kid, um, my Christmas stocking, my mother would often put an orange in it. And it seemed kind of weird to me. Like, why did she always put an orange in my Christmas stocking? And then I learned sort of like your grandmother, like oranges were a scarce, rare commodity when she was a kid. So because our brains are wired in youth, like when she was a kid, like she got excited about an orange. So and she was sharing that excitement with me, which I needless to say, didn't appreciate. <laughs> and so to think that like maybe when I was young, I discovered a mango or some other fruit. And I thought, oh, I'd be happy if I could have all like, and then like now, like cherries, I love cherries, but now they've made cherries available like all the time. And now people just find fault with that. It doesn't make you happy. <laughs> yes. So, so then obviously you would think today because we have unlimited things, Right. Not everybody. Obviously, there are people that are struggling and there's financial, but we have we have more means and more stuff today than ever before. Do you think that drives a lot of our unhappiness as well? It's always like we're seeking. Um, so everyone has always been <clears throat> seeking since human began, And before that, apes were always seeking. So we seek because our brain rewards it with dopamine. So dopamine makes you feel good when you anticipate a reward. 
And then your brain quickly habituates to any reward you have. So it takes a new and improved reward to, to get the excitement. And a simple example I always use is if I walk into a chocolate shop, like the smell is like makes me ecstatic. And I think, well, what if I got a job in this chocolate shop? Would I be ecstatic forever? If just, from, but no, because your brain habituates to the smell and then it stops making you happy. So no matter what time period you lived in, this is how it works. Okay, that's good to know because it feels like we're just more indulgent than we should be, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, because it's like you you're working in a chocolate shop where you have it all the time, so it stops making you feel good. Another simple example is hot running water. So all through human history, you couldn't it like getting water was a lot of work, getting hot water was even more work. So, but then when you have unlimited hot running water, it doesn't make you happy. Oh, goodness. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, so what really, so obviously you covered a little bit of the good feelings for dopamine, but we're really, your book really goes in depth on dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. So give us kind of the rundown of how those different neurotransmitters are made and what really triggers them. Sure. So dopamine is the anticipation of reward. And what is a reward is anything that meets your survival needs. But once your basic survival needs are met, then you look for new and improved. And because our basic survival needs are met, we're all looking for new and improved. And how do we define that is with neural pathways built from past dopamine. So we could use hundreds of examples. So one of them, you know, maybe people are thinking of harmful examples, like if you ate a whole pizza in a bad moment of your life and it made you feel better than it wired you to seek pizza. Um, but, um, but then there are also healthy examples like um, if you were young and you, you worked really hard and you got a reward and you got recognition, then it, it wired you to say, oh, I'm going to keep trying because that works. Okay. So um, let's move on to oxytocin. So people often use the term social bonding and it feels good. And yet if it were that easy, we'd all do it, right? Like that's what they're teaching in college courses that hanging out with your friends makes you happy. Like college kids don't need to hear this. If it were that easy, they, you know, they're already doing that. So why is it hard? So in the animal world, if you stick with the herd, it protects you from predators, but there's a downside to sticking with the herd. So to put it crudely, your food is peed on if you are too, you know, if you stick with the herd. So animals would rather spread out and not eat food that has been peed on. But then as soon as you're too isolated, then you worry because a predator picks off the one that gets isolated. So you're always making this frustrating decision between do I want to step closer to the herd or do I want to trot off to greener pasture? And it's frustrating to have to make that choice, but I remind myself that every animal is making that choice in every minute. And let's move on to serotonin. So this is what really amazed me when I read it because no one ever tells you. So animals are very competitive and that's been known for a whole century that biologists have studied this. And in the 80s, it was discovered that when an animal, when a mammal puts itself in the one-up position, it gets a little bit of serotonin. And it's not aggression, but it's confidence. Because if there's like a banana between you and me, and we both want the banana, but if I think I'm weaker than you, I know that you will bite me if I grab the banana. That's what animals do. So I don't want to get bitten, so I pull back. But then I'm starving. So then I look for another banana where I'm in the one-up position. So serotonin is your brain signal that it's safe to assert. And of course we want that feeling, but we don't have it every minute because it's not safe to assert every minute. So we need to be realistic about the real job of these chemicals. That's interesting because that's totally not how it's portrayed in psychology, psychiatry, biochemistry even. 
we have this we have this we have this opinion that serotonin is what makes you feel good it's because you don't have enough serotonin that you don't feel good but it's but it's really this more competitive sort of confidence and give and take within a relationship right Or, or the herd relationship Yes, or or among strangers. So what it is, is your brain is constantly making social comparisons because in the animal world, that's how they survive. So watch any of David Attenborough's earlier series and he shows you the, the constant calculations. Of, and it's important to know that it's basically a selfish impulse that I want you to protect me, but you want me to protect you. So... How can we survive? Well, if we make a mutual alliance, like I trust you to protect me, but then you trust me to protect you. So that's that's part of the mammalian thing that makes us feel safe. But then if there's a mating opportunity or if there's only one banana, you know, so we still like uh, animals avoid conflict by comparing themselves to others and they only fight when both individuals think they're that they would win but animals are very good at predicting who would win and they withdraw if they think they would lose. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So yeah, it's, it's as long as we can get along and we can share a little bit, we're great. But as soon as, as soon as that one opportunity for mating comes along, all bets are off and it's whoever's strongest is going to win regardless. I didn't realize that, that there, there was a calculation almost there of like, okay, I, I don't think I'm even got a chance. So I'm going to walk away. You know, there was always this, you know, watching enough David Attenborough things, there's always this sort of idea that any, like any two males are going to go and fight if there's an, a mating opportunity, but that's not true. That hierarchy is, is much more so. Is that true in most of the animal kingdom? Obviously apes. And I would think chimpanzees, the animals that share all, all mammals. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then uh, for non-mammals, you know, we go into more detail, but, um, and it's, uh, it's not just males. So females are tremendously competitive too, but in each species, it works in different ways and we've all seen it. So one would be to compete for what biologists call like better paternal genes. Um, but another is that when a female gets more food, she offers her children richer milk. And then they have sort of a higher survival rates. Another is that when a female competes for better social alliances, she has more quote unquote babysitting, which like in in the monkey world, it really is true that when like who, who takes care of your children while you're out looking for food is a matter of life and death. So yeah, all of this has been studied. It's just it's disappeared in the past few years because it's not politically correct. And, and that's why I left the academic world because there was all of this filtering of reality. Right, well, that doesn't sell medications. If you understood that this is, this is actually our mammal instincts at play, that, you know, that there is maybe not a mental illness here, it actually is some of those normal natural drivers of our animal instinct and that if we sort of peel back those layers, we can understand ourselves better. I want to go back because you talked a little bit about that early childhood experience and how how instrumental that is, because obviously that's that neural pathway that gets started. Can you talk a little bit about why childhood you know, bonding and and childhood experiences are so important to how we sort of develop our adult view of how we see the world and where we're safe and not. Sure. So there's a substance called myelin, which is a fatty substance that coats neurons the way insulation quote uh, coats a wire. And then the neuron can conduct electricity up to a hundred times faster. We have a lot of myelin before age eight and during puberty. So whenever we activate neurons, they strengthen their connections. But when we activate them during those years, that builds myelinated pathways. So we are all navigating the world with the pathways we built before age eight, excuse me, before age eight and during puberty. And no one is going to have a perfect neural network built from those years that's going to be a perfect predictor of adult life. So there's no use saying, oh, I had a bad childhood and other people had a good, you know, but it's just 
we're all biased to seek things that felt rewarding when we were young and avoid things that felt threatening when we were older. And we're all challenged then to not over rely on our myelinated pathways and what I call blaze new trails in your jungle of neurons. Okay. Okay. So it really, you know, because I think a lot of people think of trauma, big T, little t, most people think things have to be really traumatic and big, like big, big things. But, you know, those, because obviously those pathways are much more enriched, let's say they're a super highway rather than a dirt road that we might produce when we're 40, then just small things like what could be, could be perceived as a child of negligence, right? Disinterest of a parent or, you know, lack of attention, those kind of things could be really, really impactful because that super highway is being built. Yes, so. but look at it the other way. If a child gets too much attention from their parent, then they don't learn their own power to face the world on their own. So you could build myelinated pathways to expect the world to come to you, to expect other people to let you sit on their couch and order pizza on with their phone. You know what I mean? And um, so, yeah, we, we were over focused on this trauma thing, but the brain learns from rewards and pain. And so every experience of rewards biases you to look for that reward and every experience of pain biases you to fear that kind of pain. Yeah. So what you're really saying is, is we, we need to experience both and it's actually not good to try and, you know, buffer every negative experience or any painful experience. Cause you're actually robbing somebody in this particular case in the conversation, a child of their capacity to learn how to operate in the world and have confidence and, and the abilities to really become a fully fledged adult with decision-making that's coming from a healthy brain. Yes, exactly. Um, and a big part of the pleasure of a reward is the steps toward it. That's what stimulates the dopamine. So we all know that if someone just gives you a reward, it doesn't feel as exciting as when you get it through your own efforts. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So the anticipation of it, the expectation of getting to what you want to do. So I want to go back. So obviously social comparison is a big thing that we see, particularly today because we have social media. So there's this constant barrage of who you are compared to someone else. So obviously this is natural, I would say from what you're saying to, because it's a natural drive to secure resources, right? So, you know, it's, um, and to keep yourself safe, secure resources while also avoiding conflict, because if you secure resources, and again, like all the nature videos, they show like, if the little monkey grabs for a banana near a bigger monkey, they will bite their arm. Sometimes they literally open their mouth and pull the food out of their mouth. Oh, wow. Even juveniles. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. And I, I always say in all my books, it's not easy being a mammal. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. So, you know, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating about your book when I was reading it, you know, we think of oxytocin as a love drug, right? Because of social bonding. But the relationship of our brains doing kind of anything. So it can also, oxytocin can also be developed in negative ways, or I say, um, like things that we would con construe negatively, I guess I should say that, like joining a gang, creating wars, that we, that actually there's an oxytocin piece of that. Because I, I know I, I have a friend of mine that researches it in the context of sexuality and human expression and relationships. And it's like, okay, that's great. But that's, but there's also, you can get that same hit of oxytocin from doing things that we perceive societally as negative. Talk a little bit about that. Cause that to me was really surprising. I was like, oh, I never thought about it. So we want social support. And in the animal world, again, the isolated individual is quickly picked off by predators. So when you smell a predator, you run back to the herd. And that's when you have that good feeling of oxytocin. Now, in like if a gazelle runs to the wrong herd, they're not going to let it in. And so the predator can eat it. So it's like, ah, this is my herd. So um, apart from like the two 
extremes, you're thinking of love versus war. Let's think about if you go to a concert and there are 10,000 people there and they're all cheering your favorite performer. So on the one hand, they're not really supporting you like tomorrow morning when you wake up and face the world, they're not going to be there for you. So it's the illusion of support. Like here's this huge herd that shares my joy. And so we look for that. So another famous example is person goes to the pub and at the pub, they at least give themselves the illusion of these people understand me, but really all they understand with is that as soon as I finish this beer, I want another one, but I feel supported by them because these other people don't want me to have another beer. So we all define that feeling of support in our own way, which is based on how we got it when we were young. Okay. Another simple example is like when a person is, on a sports team or in the theater and like you have this group with you all the time and then you get an injury and let's say you can't be in the sport anymore you can't be in the theater anymore and then you don't you feel like a predator is going to eat you because you don't know how to create that feeling of social support wow yes so that yeah it's all that yeah creating that social support regardless of how you're getting it you're looking for the opportunity to do so so obviously our brain is wired by past experiences, experiences. And so I'm sure I'm gonna ask this question for everybody else because this is where their head is going. What does it take to rewire it? So um, this, the sad truth is repetition is what it takes to rewire it. And repetition sounds unfun. <laughs> so that's why people tend not to do it. But on the other hand, it's great to know that we have that power that we can rewire and it takes so much repetition that you can only rewire one thing at a time. But if you focus on that one thing for about six weeks, you'll do it. And then you could start on another project. So that's what my work is focused on. So, so let's say someone is, um, let's say they've got a, a lot of anxiety about social interactions, let's say. You know, it's that desire to, to be with the herd, but also terrified to be with the herd. So what what tools do you think would be some of the things that people can use? Because I know you've got lots of tools of like self-exploration in your book. What are, what are just one or two things they would get from your book to help them sort of think through, what do I do to rewire? Sure. So you want to start one new little habit at a time. And I'll give you an example of one that I used. Um, I noticed I uh, had trouble with eye contact and, you know, because of, you know, we all have our history, whatever. So I'm not saying this is a universal problem. Um, but if I, like, if maybe I guess this is sort of universal though, if you smile at someone and they don't smile back at you, God, it feels like, oh my God, something terrible has happened. So rejection is like, you know, a predator is going to eat me kind of feeling. And then you might hate that person and you come up with some story about why they hate you, blah, blah, blah. So instead, so here's a little thought experiment. So when I was at the store, like in the olden days when we paid with money, <laughs> um, so I would give the cashier money and the cashier would give me change. Now, I may not make eye contact with that person. Like I'm busy, I'm looking at my stuff. I have my hand out, I'm looking for whatever. So then I'm going to practice. I'm going to make eye contact with that person when they are giving me the change. But then they may not make eye contact with me because they're busy doing something else. And they've been rejected all day by people not looking at them. And I'm not saying anybody should or should not. I'm saying that we overreact to this minutia. And so it's just a way to practice in a, in a low threat, you know, um, a low stakes situation. So practice in low stakes situation. Another great example is if you or in a meeting and you think I'm gonna raise my hand and I'm gonna say something and everyone's gonna think it's so brilliant. And if you don't get the reaction you want, you may feel devastated. And that's a real loop that you have in your brain from your past, that when your expectations are not met, your threat chemicals turn on, but instead you could say, okay, I'm going to 
I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to say something. And then I'm going to give myself a good feeling. And I don't mean a good feeling by saying, oh, they're all jerks. They don't appreciate me. No, that's not. It's like, I'm going to put myself up without putting others down. So, and then the first time you do it, it's going to feel stupid or worse. And, but if you keep doing it, then it just becomes your norm. And I, I like the fact that because you're you're talking about just straight out research shows that we don't have to do like we can take that one behavior and it's not like, OK, two years from now, I'm going to recover from this. <laughs> right? You know, and so it so it really is. It takes six weeks. OK, everybody, it takes six weeks to rewire your brain. Pick your first one. <laughs> it, yeah. And every day you go to that meeting and you say what you want and you make eye contact and you do it kindly without anger. And then afterwards you say something nice to yourself about it. And then you're not creating a life or death situation about every little social interaction, which if you did that before, it's partly because in the animal world, these really are life and death situations. And partly because that was wired into you when you were young. Absolutely. Absolutely. So is there anything else you want to tell my my listeners that they need to know about our lovely brain chemistry, dopamine, serotonin and oxytocin and and how to rewire your brain? Well, we haven't really done unhappy chemicals. So very quickly, maybe oh, I'll yes. mention that. So um, cortisol is the threat chemical and it lasts in your body a lot longer than the happy chemicals. So what's a threat? Again, your brain defines it with a combination of in the animal world, isolation or um, a, a, a low blood sugar would be like immediate survival threats. And then when you were young, whatever context triggered your cortisol, neurons connect very quickly and a, a simple solution, very in the interest of time. So I talk about like thanking your cortisol for trying to protect you. So a simple example is you don't have to touch a hot stove twice because the first time you touched a stove, the bad feeling wired you that the next time you see a stove, you're going to pull your hand back before you touch it. So your brain is always trying to warn you like, whoa, don't touch that. Don't get burned by that. Don't get burned. By so you're always trying to anticipate threats. And that's what we're all doing. And when you notice the way you're doing that, then you could say, oh, it's not a real survival threat. It's just an old cortisol circuit. And that once I trigger it, it's going to last in my body for about an hour, but then my body will just metabolize it and I'll go back to normal. So, which is, which is awesome. I want to ask you this question because, um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Robert Sapolsky's work, you know, why zebras don't get ulcers. And he's obviously written many more books after that. But, uh, you know, I, when we look at the animal kingdom, I would say cortisol, this is my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, cortisol is often high, like if they're foraging for food and because food is scarce, their, their cortisol is going to be higher, it's going to hit hunger hormones and all those other pieces. Now, there's also just a concept that animals generally don't have high cortisol for long periods of time, except in those sort of scarcity things. Is that a correct assumption? So... Sapolsky was has a certain ideology, which is that all of your unhappiness is society's fault. And in a good society, you would never be unhappy and you would be happy all the time. And he may still think that, but one thing he doesn't think anymore is at, now we know what causes ulcers, right? Because at the time we didn't even know that, right? <laughs> true, that's true. Yes, that's true. It's an infection. So, Thanks, Lori. But so, but the part of, that I agree with him on, so we humans have a big cortex and our cortex can process abstractions that animals cannot process. So animals don't think about a predator unless it's there, but we humans can create the risk, the threat in our own brain, even when we don't smell it or see it or touch it. And you can drive yourself crazy um, triggering threats all the time. And the reason we do that is because we're aware of our own mortality and animals are not. And so you know that something's gonna get you someday. And your, your mammal brain 
is obsessed with survival and your human brain knows that you're not going to survive. So when you plug these two brains into each other, you can drive yourself crazy. <laughs> so my goodness. Yes. So absolutely. It's uh, and, and just our world today, I would say we just, we have so many things that we do and how we live um, that just drives that anticipation, cortisol, stress response. I'm not safe. Life isn't. Well, the and- news, of course, is a constant feed of survival threat messages. So I never, ever watch the news. And um, I especially don't look at um, threatening entertainment at night. Like, you know, if you watch people getting exploded and dying a slow death of cancer just before you fall asleep, then you're not going to sleep. And sleep is when you manufacture your happy chemicals so that they're ready and reserved the next day. So that's very important. I'm glad you said that. I checked out of mainstream TV and especially mainstream news 18 years ago. I was like, never again. I'm not watching it. I do not care what the major news networks are doing because they are doing it to make money and to get ratings and and to scare to scare people because that polarizes and gets more ratings. So I agree with you. So I want I would love for you to share the name of your book and where everybody can get it so they can go out and get your book and understand how to really rewire these happy chemicals. Sure. Um, I have a lot of books with different angles. The introductory book is Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. And it's available in all the usual places. And my website has information about all of my resources, innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And a lot of my resources are free. And then I have a lot of other books and an online video course about different aspects of these things. And we'll definitely put links in the show notes on how to get to intermammal.org, institute, intermammalinstitute.org. And, and of course, obviously you can find her books on all the Amazon and other book purveyors. So thank you so much, Loretta, for being on here and explaining this really, really not necessarily just interesting topic, but such an important topic. And especially after two and a half years of pandemic and isolation, and I think where people's emotional states may be. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me and for the great questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Loretta Bruning is the founder of the Inner Mammal Institute and Professor Emerita of Management at California State University, East Bay. She's the author of many personal development books, including Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. As a teacher and a parent, she was not convinced by the prevailing theories of human motivation. Then she learned about the brain chemistry we we share with early mammals, and everything started to make sense. She began creating resources that have helped thousands of people make peace with their inner mammal. Dr. Bruning's work has been translated into 12 languages and is cited in major media. Before teaching, she worked for the United Nations in Africa, and Loretta gives zoo tours on animal behaviors after serving as a docent at the Oakland Zoo. She's a graduate of Cornell University and Tufts. The Inner Mammal Institute offers videos, podcasts, books, blogs, multimedia, and a training program, as well as a free five-day happy chemical jumpstart. And you can find her information at innermammalinstitute.org. And so today I would love for you to join me and listen to this conversation because what you will learn today is some very exciting information on how to rewire your brain so you can reduce your cortisol levels and improve your dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. The other thing we talked about is some of the shared things that we have with manimal shared behaviors and how our adaptive behavior both maladaptive bad and good are driven really by this very shared 
brain wiring that we have with mammals. And I think anybody that's struggling with mental and emotional health issues will find this to be really, really valuable. And if you yourself don't struggle with it, if you know somebody who's struggling with anxiety, depression, and, and other social pressures and stress, this would be a great, great interview to listen to and possibly listen to again. So thank you for listening to this functional life. Let's get on the air with Dr. Loretta Bruning.